And we're going to talk in the next 20 minutes or so about uh, bariatric surgery and surgery in the morbidly obese patient. Uh, we're going to go over the definition, what's obesity, the prevalence, the impact that obesity has in the uh, patient's life, what are the associated illness, the surgical treatments, what are the patient who could benefit from this surgery, and what are the results of the surgery itself. So what is an obese patient? Uh, in surgery and in the medical uh, world in general, we don't look about weight. In fact, what we use is the body mass index, is a number that comes from uh, an equation where weight is compared to the square height of the patient. This number, the BMI, will uh, divide patients into several categories, patients who have a normal weight between 18.5 to 24.9, who are underweight, 18.5 or less, overweight, 25 to 29.9, and obese patients that have a BMI greater than 30. If the BMI is greater than 40, the patient is considered morbidly obese. Why morbidly? Because most likely it does have some comorbid conditions that are associated to the obesity. Let's talk about a little bit the incidence and the prevalence of obesity throughout the years. I'd like to show you these trends uh, over the, na the last 25 years in the United States. The color matches the statistic of the different states. And I'd like to attract your attention to two things. First of all, you see that all the states, and you have a lot in the United States, are in color, which means that in 1985, lots of data were missing about obesity. What is, does this mean? That wasn't really a great problem in 1985. Most of the population where we had the statistics was under 10% or between 10 and 40%. Now, let's see what happened in, can I go to the next one? Yes. Ten years later, you see start, now you start to see some darker color. So uh, obesity raised uh, in all the states between 50% uh, and 19%. And then in 2000, more obese people. 2010, and this is rather scary. There is not one single state in the United States where obesity is below 20% of the population. That's a lot. So we do really have a, a big problem. So worldwide, we have 1.7 billion of obese people. 1.5 to two times uh, women are uh, more obese than men. And about 30% of the population in the United States is obese. It seems little, but it's not. That's a very big problem. Also, if you consider that about 60 to 80% of African American are obese. And that's why. Well, you can have in fast food chains 800 calories for less than $1. So if your socioeconomic status is not that good, you have to feed yourself, and that's where you're going to go and look for foods. Uh, we do know today that obesity is a major health problem worldwide because also of the high incidence of comorbid condition, because of the socioeconomic cost. If you're obese, you cost to the uh, health insurance because you're sicker than uh, normal weight people, and you die early. So your life expectancy is decreased by 2.4 years. And you're sick. Comorbid conditions such as hypertension, diabetes, asthma, sleep apnea, high cholesterol, arthritis, infertility, depression, are very often associated to morbid obesity and also cancer. You have a higher risk to have breast cancer, colon cancer, which are the most common cancer in men and women, endometrial cancer, all cancer basically except pancreatic and prostate cancer. And if we look at this uh, curves that shows you how obesity can decrease your life expectancy, well, those curves are scary to me. Here on the, on, uh, on the right side, you have the BMI of the patient, and then you have the relative risk of death for men and women. So the more the BMI increases, the less you leave. So we have a big problem, very big problem. And this is the kind of patient you'd be confronted to uh, if you're a surgeon. Not, it doesn't, you don't have to be a bariatric surgeon. This is the kind of patient you can see 
uh, in any kind of emergency surgery, or even if you're a physician, if you have a cardiac arrest, well, this is what you have to deal with. And we have even a bigger problem, children getting bigger and bigger. The rate of obesity in uh, children is between 17 and 33%. So if you look at that, we uh, can make some, uh, some um, cal cal um, calculations. By 2012, we expect that more than 2 billion people will be overweight and 600 million will be obese. And on the left side, you can look at the cost burden of obesity-related condition to the society and the health industry. Those numbers are exp uh, expressed in billions. Let's look at diabetes. Only diabetes costs to the state 98 billions of dollars per year. That's a lot. So obesity is a money machine because these people are sick. And if you look at the statistic of bariatric surgical device and pharmaceutical device produced to treat obesity from a surgical point of view and a medical point of view, you can see that uh, in 2015, uh, they go sky high. So industry is investing in obesity because you make money out of it. Patients that are obese have lots of comorbid conditions, and those you have to deal with, even if you're not thinking about operating the patient for a bariatric procedure. One condition in particular has to be looked at very carefully, and that is obstructive sleep apnea. 3% prevalence in the general population, 91% prevalence in the morbid obese population, and is associated with a cardiac problem, arrhythmias, you can have uh, infarction, you can have hypercoagulability, you can have increased postoperative respiratory distress, prolonged hospital stay. If you have a patient in which you suspect sleep apnea before uh, doing any elective surgery, that patient needs to be studied, and if he does need to wear a mask to help him breathe, you have to uh, take care of it before the surgery and ask the patient to bring that mask with him during the surgery. And you know that that patient can make a respiratory problem, so you have to watch him very carefully. Hypercoagulability, you know that obese patients have a much higher risk factor for pulmonary embolism, deep venous thrombosis, increased risk if the surgery is prolonged. With the position of surgery, if you have reverse Rundellenberg, which we really often have when we operate on, uh, in, in this kind of patient, and of course the pneumoperitoneum. So if you're operating in laparoscopy, you know that the risk is slightly increased. Of course, they can have surgical complication uh, or more uh, complication related to the surgery. Rhabdomyolysis is something we see very rarely today. But if you remember the picture I showed you, you can imagine the weight of that patient on his muscle and on the operative um, table. So the muscle can start to, to break off, basically. So what do you have to do to prevent this kind of complication? You have to minimize the surgical time, uh, if you can, of course, and the anesthesia time. You have to be careful when you put the patient on the operating table with better padding. Uh, make sure the position is correct. You have to do a crash test, which I strongly recommend if you want to, if you want to survive the surgery and don't want the patient to fall on yourself. And you have to monitor routinely the lab. Wound infection, a much higher risk in obese patients, especially because of the high prevalence of diabetes. Uh, try to use high-spectrum antibiotics if indicated. Try to do a multi-layer closure just in case the wound gets infected. You can drain it out uh, more easily. Control if the patient is diabetic, uh, the, uh, the blood sugar. You have to supplement the patient with oxygen whenever necessary. And uh, try to do a minimal invasive approach if possible through laparoscopy instead of a uh, laparotomy. And then, of course, uh, obese patients have a higher risk of incisional hernia, and that is because of the weight uh, of uh, of the organs, intra-abdominal organs, and the intra-abdominal pressure. <laughs>